Good morning, Peter Malloy here with my helper Simeon on this, the third Sunday in Lent. It is, uh, as I suspect you know, we film these on Saturday afternoon and it is a beautiful, beautiful day. We're here at uh, the Church of St. Mary the Virgin in Buxted and uh, it was a beautiful day. We, uh, we were outside a bit today. Yeah. Simeon was doing a very Lenten activity. He was, he was pulling weeds that uh, had grown up between patio stones and uh, that was a good thing, eh? <laughs> I hope you have made uh, good use of, of your uh, uh, day and uh, uh, engaging in, in similarly Lenten activities such as pulling weeds. Um, I want to remind you that during this time of, of uh, service closure, the churches of St. Mary's and St. Margaret's are uh, open for private prayer, and uh, we're hoping to open St. Mark's um, later this week uh, also for private prayer, but we need to do some uh, cleanup and preparation there. And uh, so please do avail yourself of them. We continue on with YouTube, of course, and uh, we had a wonderful uh, hymn mashup. Bible, no, hymn. Hymn mashup quiz. Hymn mashup quiz um, uh, from uh, Jeff on Friday. And uh, uh, we've had other things, school assembly videos and uh, other music. And so please uh, do check those out. Um, uh, we've received a number of questions lately about when we're going to reopen for services. As you will recall, uh, we made the decision just before Christmas to suspend services um, uh, with, with, I would say, overwhelming support in that direction. Um, uh, at that time, the infection rate in, in our district was, I think, around between 800 and 1,000 per 100,000 persons. Um, now it's down... Persons? Or people. What? Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, we're down now around 22, I think I saw read on the news the other day. And so we're trying to see, and as well with the vaccine rollout, you know, we're in a very different set of circumstances. So please do uh, contact either myself or the wardens uh, if you have opinions or concerns about opening uh, services. It would, of course, be dependent upon our being able to open safely, and that's going to involve, you know, a, a major kind of clean through the churches, which is reasonable, um, but also um, practicing uh, safe practices in the church with regards to masks and social distancing. Um, and having sides people at the churches who are able to guide people into those safe practices. Um, and so we do need all of those and we need support from people. It's not just a matter of, of opening services. Um, and especially I'm aware at St. Margaret's, we do need a few more deputy warden, not deputy wardens, uh, sorry, I don't want to displace anyone, uh, but we do need more duty wardens and sides people for that. And uh, if you are able to uh, assist in that ministry, then please uh, do help us with that. How do you keep track of all these different wardens? I know there are a lot of wardens. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. But this is the third Sunday in Lent, and uh, let's just take a moment now to prepare our hearts for worship. Will you read the scripture verses for today? The sacrifices God of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, so to anger and of great kindness, and repent. Of the evil. Mm -hmm. Now these are the sentences that we read through uh, through Lent. Do you know what do you know what they're getting at? Not a clue. <laughs> well, they both talk about ways in which we show that we are actually repentant before God, and so uh, the first one comes from David, as he um, uh, there was a psalm where where he confessed his sin as it related to Bathsheba. And the most important sacrifice was not what he would do in terms of goats and, and cattle and sacrifices of wealth, but it was the, the internal sacrifice. And similarly, in the second one, coming from the prophet Joel, uh, in the culture of that day, when people wanted to show that they were truly upset, they would take their garments and they would rip them and tear them to show just how distraught they were. And what Joel is saying is the important thing is not that you, you rip your garments, but rather that your heart is 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 broken in that way that you that you um, that the eternal um, uh, repentance is more imp important than the external uh, uh, penitence. 
All right, the psalm appointed for this day is Psalm 25, and we begin on the eighth verse. Gracious and righteous is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. Them that are meek shall he guide in judgment, and such as are gentle, them shall he teach the, his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, be merciful unto my sin, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Mine eyes are ever looking unto thee, the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The lesson appointed for this day comes from the 11th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning at the 14th verse. Now Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household fails. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor, in which he trusted, and, divided, and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they that enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So, I mean, you've heard that line before. He that is not with me is against me. You've heard that before, right? Eh? Yeah. And what do you think it means? Jesus is talking here about this, this work that he is doing in casting out demons in people. And some of the, 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 the people um, are saying, well, if he's got this much power, it must come from the devil, because they're kind of thinking, you know, he's, he's not, you know, they want to discredit what he's doing. But, but Jesus says it doesn't make any sense. Why, why would the devil help me cast out demons when it's the devil's goal to, to uh, put their spirits in people? And so he says, it doesn't, it's, it's like you and I were playing um, a video game with mum a little while. That, uh, what's the one, that, the soccer one? Rocket League. Rocket League. And it was you and I against mummy. And you got upset with me because I went and scored on our own net. Um, because I was kind of feeling bad for mum because she's not as good as we are. Uh, and you got upset. And I was kind of doing it just because I didn't want mum to, you know, lose by too much, right? But your point was, if we're trying to win, we should try to win. And Jesus is saying the same, that if, if you were on a team, that team has to be unified. And that goes for the devil, it goes for Jesus, and as we're going to see, it goes for our own, our own spiritual battles. We can't both um, uh, try to score goals on, on uh, the opposition's net and on our own. All right. The colleague appointed for this the third Sunday in Lent. We beseech the Almighty God, look upon the hearty desires of thy humble servants, and stretch forth the right hand of thy majesty to be our defense against all our enemies, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, will you hold this for me? 
Our lesson this morning is again an encouragement for us to engage in this season of spiritual battle. On the first Sunday in Lent, we had the example of Jesus and his fasting in the desert for 40 days, and indeed in his own spiritual battle. You're gonna sit up right there. The first, uh, last week we saw the Canaanite woman's daughter being healed of demonic possession through an act of faith. And the accompanying epistles that we've seen for both of those weeks have also made it clear that the Christian life is never one of being settled or plateauing, but it is always moving forward into greater holiness and union with God. And if we are not moving forward, we are indeed moving backwards. This morning we see our Lord pointing to a certain reality which clarifies the nature of our spiritual lives. Jesus is casting out demons and, and people don't know what to make of it. Some, we are told, are, are astonished by this and we can assume are moved towards belief, but others not so much. And as is the nature of naysayers, they account his success not to a victory, but to something nefarious. Mark's account has these people being Pharisees. Uh, Luke says just some people. Uh, I think it works both ways because I think we all know we have Pharisees in each of us. But Jesus knows what they're thinking and he tackles it head on with the simple truth that their accusation makes no sense and if broadly applied, would condemn uh, broadly to them as well. Jesus' point is simple. A kingdom divided cannot but fall. And the logic, again, is applied, uh, applies uh, in a variety of ways. Imagine how unsustainable a football or a rugby team would be if they moved the ball both ways, up and down the field. They would never win any games. And if it is true of Jesus and of his ministry, it is true of us and our ministry. So also it is true of our Christian lives. We are called to be all in in our spiritual journey. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters, we are told. We have to have an, an undivided vision. And I do hope this Lenten season you are engaging in spiritual battle. But if you are not, then none of what's being said this morning will make any sense. If, however, you are being engaging in spiritual battle, then you must be aware of the truth pointed out in this passage of battling in one area, but allowing sin to reign in others. It would be like bailing out the stern of a boat and emptying your butt buckets in the bow. It would not help in the least. So in our lives, if we were, for instance, to give up chocolates or, or wine for Lent and make it through 40 days with our record intact, we may approach Easter with a smug self-righteousness and self-satisfaction, and that is surely a last state which is far worse than the first. If our Lenten disciplines leave us feeling a little better about ourselves as we judge ourselves relative to our friends and neighbors, then our last state is worse than the first. We're confronted this morning by another hard saying of our Lord, Whoever is not with me is against me. Jesus equates mere tolerance of himself and his work and mission as, op as open opposition. He says, neutrality is effectively opposition. You have to be for me. He interprets our indecisiveness and our indifference in the worst possible light. And in that searing light, how can we escape judgment? We imagine that our inactivity, our lack of a position, our abstention somehow keeps us innocent, but we forget that our sins of omission are indeed the greatest. In our Anglican tra tradition of confession, we confess first that we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and it is a clear sign of Christian spiritual maturity when those, our sins of omission, are recognized by our conscience to be more serious than our sins of commission. By toleration, even when that stems from ignorance, we are guilty of an immeasurable weight of evil. By thoughtlessness, silence, inactivity, not thinking, not speaking, not doing, we are in fact guilty, very guilty. 
For inasmuch as we have not openly sided with Jesus Christ and his truth and his love in all things, we stand and live against Christ. He makes it very clear. He that is not with me is against me. Our Lord warns us today about what we should call spiritual indifference. He says there is no neutral ground here. You must either stand boldly with him, under him, beside him, and for him, or you stand against him. You either gather with him, or you are his enemy, dividing and scattering. In the words of Jesus before us today, you and I are described as a house, a palace. Our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, these are abodes or dwelling places. And at, at issue is in whom will they, in who will dwell in them. Jesus has come to liberate us from the tyranny of evil, but he comes as well to make us free members of his kingdom. And unless we accept his rule and authority, our taste of liberation will be short and fleeting, and the last state worse than the first. And so we need to pray. We need to pray earnestly to be spared the sins of self-righteousness and self-satisfaction, that God would open our eyes to see and know ourselves as we truly are, to see and know his love and forgiveness in Jesus Christ, and that we may wake up from spiritual and moral death. We come to Christ aright only when we know that we are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. But when we come as such, he gives us joy and mercy, riches, sight, and clothing. We come with nothing to offer but broken hearts. Yet this is exactly what he wants. And our broken hearts may receive him, so that renewed in the love of Christ, we may walk in love as Christ has loved us. Amen. Simeon, let's say the Lord's Prayer together, and I invite you to pray with us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Most merciful Father, we beseech thee to send down thy heavenly blessing upon thy church in this parish, that all its members may dwell together in unity and brotherly love. Keep far from us all self-will and discord. Endue thy ministers with righteousness and enable them faithfully to dispense thy holy word and sacraments, to bring again the outcasts and to seek the lost. Grant that we may so receive their ministrations and use their means, thy means of grace, that in all our words and deeds we may seek thy glory and the advancement of thy kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us take a moment to remember before God any concerns that we have upon our hearts. We remember those who we know to be in need in our parish. And so we pray for Lindsay and Wilbs George, Jane Godfrey, Kit Butcher, and Desmond Burton. We pray for the family of Dennis Garland. And we entrust these situations unto your most gracious keeping. And this we beg for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And let's take a moment this morning to give thanks to Almighty God for the many blessings that we have received from his hand. O most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee, we humbly thank thee for all thy gifts so freely bestowed upon us, for life and health and safety, for power to work and leisure to rest, for all that is beautiful in creation and in the lives of men, we praise and magnify thy holy name. But above all, we thank thee for our spiritual mercies in Christ Jesus our Lord, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, and we pray especially today for Prince Philip in his recovery. 
We pray for those in authority, the parliaments of the Commonwealth, and all who are set in authority under her, that they may order all things in wisdom, righteousness, and peace, to the honor of thy holy name and the good of thy church and people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and clergy and all congregations commit to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace. And we pray especially today for Bishop Martin and Bishop Wills, and we pray for Father David and myself, your unworthy servant. We pray, Lord, that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing, and grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's conclude our time by saying the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. All right. God bless you, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, seeing you all again soon.